Rover went to Ford and the Mini Series was relaunched by BMW. The Phoenix 4 were left with cars such as the Rover 25 and failed to create new products. In 2005, MG Rover went into administration with £1.4 billion of debt. More than 6,300 workers were laid off with a redundancy package of just £3,400. The Phoenix 4 have been banned from being directors of a company in the UK, but they came away with around £42 million. Former managing director John Towers is renovating a 450-acre property in the south of France. Deputy Chairman Nick Stevenson works in the car industry in Florida. John Edwards lives in a million-pound mansion in the Cotswolds. And Peter Beale lives in a large manor house in Worcestershire. Well, we did ask the Phoenix Four for interviews, but they declined. But a decade on, administrators are still chasing money owed to the company. That includes a £56 million VAT rebate, which could go to former workers. But the BBC understands that BMW, former owners of Rover, of course, are also chasing that money. Here's an exclusive report now from our business correspondent, Peter Plisner. Some of the defining images from 10 years ago. It was a day many had predicted, but no one wanted to see. MG Rover's collapse sent shockwaves through the region's automotive industry and left administrators no option but to make almost 6,000 people redundant overnight. Ten years on, the original administrator, Rob Hunt, is still involved with MG Rover. He remembers vividly the day he and his colleagues walked into Longbridge. It was a very busy day. A very disappointing day because uh, it, it required us to act quickly but to stand in front of a lot of people to explain what had happened and we all knew the potential ramifications for many thousands of employees in the Longbridge area. So far the administration and subsequent liquidation has cost a staggering £16 million but around £165 million has been recovered and distributed to those who lost money when MG Rover collapsed. It's one of the longest running cases I personally have been involved in, but that reflects the complexity of it. We also have a number of large claims that we're left to deal with, which could uh, lead to further recoveries for the benefit of the creditors. One of the biggest recoveries of money involves reclaiming some VAT that was overpaid when cars made here at Longbridge were sold. If it can be recovered, it could mean £56 million plus interest over a number of years being shared out amongst creditors, including former MG Rover workers. But administrators aren't the only ones trying to lay claim to that money. Documents seen by Midlands Today show that BMW, the company that washed its hands of MG Rover 15 years ago, also wants the money. Well, we've made a claim for VAT that we believe is due back to the company. BMW have also made a claim for that VAT as well. And that matter is currently being resolved through VAT tribunals. We were successful at the lower tribunal but BMW have got the right to appeal. In a statement, BMW says we have made a claim because Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs published statements that indicate that we are the correct claimant. However, it is for the courts to decide if we are the right party to reclaim the VAT in question, and BMW Group will abide by their ultimate decision. But former workers like Adrian Ross, who used to be a union convener at Longbridge, are disgusted at BMW's attitude. BMW are a company that's making billions of pounds profit. £56 million is just a drop in the ocean to a company of their size. I believe BMW now should do the honourable thing and any money that they would receive if they were to get this VAT refund should be returned to the creditors, i.e. the former workers. Most of those who lost their jobs have already received around £600 each as debts have been recovered. If the VAT money comes through, it could mean another big payout. Peter Plisner, BBC Midlands Today.
With me now is the wife of a former rover worker, Gemma Cartwright, who became a forthright campaigner in her own right, and also Professor David Bailey from the Aston Business School. Good evening to you both. Gemma, first of all, you, you heard that um, they're looking for a £56 million VAT rebate. That in itself, what, what did you think about when you heard that? I think 10 years on, that's amazing how that figure's just come along. I know BMW are going for it, but I think what we should remember is they took the mini, they took the jewel, so let's give that funding back to the workers. Can you believe all this money that's still being talked about so long after the event? Absolutely not. Ten years on and we don't want to be here another ten years still just talking about it. It's time to give it a full stop and move forward now. What did you think, David, when you heard about all this money that's flying around? I mean, it's cost £16 million, the administration. Well, if so the administrators far. can get that £56 million back for the creditors, then great, but don't hold your breath. It's ten years on. For me, the really important thing is that the Phoenix 4 actually dip into their pockets and uh, honour the commitment that they gave was to compensate the workers. They haven't done that yet and they can still afford to do it. Do you think they will get that £56 million for the workers? I'm very sceptical of it. I mean, it's ten years on, there'll be a legal dispute over it, BMW will contest it, who knows. OK, both of you, thanks very much. We'll chat a little uh, a bit later on. OK, now what about the thousands of families who are affected because they felt their world had collapsed around them when Longbridge closed? Well, Sarah Falkland has been talking to some of them. I was totally gutted that I'd lost one of the best jobs I've ever had. And Eloise could probably feel that coming from me. It was a sad day. What happened at Rover is now a distant memory for Eloise Palmerfield, but it's something her dad can never forget. It had a massive impact, really, because obviously I lost my job. Uh, I couldn't afford to pay for my house. Uh, so eventually our house got very possessed. It also cost him his marriage. The financial strain of being out of work with only minimal redundancy payments to fall back on pushed him and his wife Alison to divorce. I was really low, you know, and, uh, you know, I really did have some bad days. And, uh, you know, there were times where I couldn't get a job. I was, I was looking around, I was getting no's from everywhere. And, uh, you know, it, it was really depressing. With the collapse of Rover, more than 6,000 families were under extreme financial pressure. And almost overnight, jobs out there which had been paying £9 an hour were suddenly paying just £5 an hour. At the centre of it all, at the eye of the storm though, one young mother who even today, a decade on, is known as the Rover Girl. Gemma Cartwright was the face of Rover families. She led a group of wives to Downing Street to try and persuade Tony Blair to bail the car firm out. She also became the focus for other people's pain. People broke up, people had their houses repossessed and sadly people took their lives. People took their lives? Yeah, we were contacted by families that um, people felt they couldn't carry on anymore. They'd lost their family, they'd lost their, you know, their norm and they just couldn't cope with it anymore and sadly that's how, how it happened in our community. She now lives in the shadow of what's left of the old car factory. Since losing his job there, her husband Andy has been made redundant no less than nine times. Watching Andrew cry and, you know, trying to realise actually that he couldn't support his family. You know, we've been on holiday once in ten years, but we've also found it financially hard, you know, paying your bills. For some, though, the collapse of Rover was the catalyst to a completely different way of life. Instead of clocking on at eight each morning, Jim Thornwell goes to the pool. For the past decade, he's been working for himself as a plasterer. My attitude to work is completely different. I, you know, work is sort of, uh, you know, means to an end, really, just to enable me to do the things that I want to do in, in my life. Like many, Jim took up the offer of free retraining. He may only earn 60% of what he took home from Longbridge, but he's content. And so too is Darren Palmerfield. After all the upheaval in his personal life, he eventually got a better paid job in the aerospace industry. Sarah Falkland, BBC Midlands Today. Well, I'm with uh, Gemma and David once more. Um, you went through a lot of pain yourself and you went through pain for others. Would you have played it differently now, Gemma? I would always start, you know, do that 
protest, protest down to London to rise the, the area and make sure that the government took us serious and didn't dictate to us. So I'd always do that. The only difference that I would do is actually pin the Phoenix down now. So when they promised the workers to actually make sure they paid out and kept their, you know, kept their promise, but I'd still fight for the community as we are 10 years on, still trying. You actually went to Downing Street many a time. Absolutely. Um, when there was an issue in the area and the AWM and the task force and everybody, I was invited to go down to ask my opinions and many a time I shared and said, that isn't working and they had to change it. First name terms with Tony Blair? Absolutely madness. First name terms with him and Alan Johnson. But they actually believed in Longbridge and they believed in our community. And when they, when we were, they asked us, you know, are the training courses working, we was actually able to tell them the truth from the grassroots. David, what do you think? Was it inevitable that this place was going to close? Did I it think, need to move on? I think in the final few years, yes, there was very little that could be done. But it was a great shock for the local economy. 10,000 jobs lost. Many workers struggled to get back into work. So the real economic and human pain was, was really quite profound. And I think one of the lessons from this is that we need to do more to support manufacturing. We are seeing an automotive revival taking place now. That provides good quality, secure employment for many people. Let's value that and let's nurture it. And that was the key lesson from this failure for me. Okay, both of you, thanks very much indeed. Well, they say um, every cloud has a silver lining. We heard in um, Sarah's report about uh, Darren and Alison, who split up, if you remember, uh, after the rover collapse. Guess what? They got together again. They've tied the knot once more. Uh, six years ago, in fact, they remarried each other and they had their reception across the road, actually, from here at the Austin Social Club. Isn't that just brilliant? Wonderful. Congratulations to them. Now, we're going to uh, hear a little bit later about the state of the car industry as it is today. But for now, let's get back to the studio. Join Amy Cole for the rest of the day's news. That's 10 years since mass car production ended at MG Rover in Longbridge, but there's still some manufacturing taking place on the site. Peter Plisner is at the MG factory for us this evening. Peter. Yes, we're in what used to be the visitor centre here at Longbridge. Now it's a sales centre, a sort of uh, dealership for the new MG brand. We're surrounded by the latest breed of MG cars. Not far away, these vehicles are produced on a production line. Uh, kits come in direct from China. It's a busy production line. It's busy and getting busier. Figures out today show that March was the best month ever for the new MG brand, selling 600 cars, up 83%. And these are the two cars that are currently produced here with me from MG Motors to UK is Matthew Chi. Matthew, it's been a slow start, but it is getting busier. Yes, it's getting a lot busier, Peter. It was a slow start because people forget that we were a brand new start company and we had to put all the investment in processes and engineering and design for these new models. But now they're coming along and they're adding to our success. But new models are coming here as well, aren't they? Absolutely. Today we launched the new MG6, which is behind you. It's had uh, fantastic reviews from the press and it builds on obviously the success of MG3, which um, gave us a record sales year last year. But 10 years on, people would have expected more on this site, wouldn't they? That may be so, but as I said earlier, we are a new start company. We've done a lot of um, investment in design and engineering and employing people in this locality to bring these vehicles to market. Now we've got them, then our success continues from here. Matthew, many thanks. Well, this is the uh, modern age of uh, MG, but I think, Nick, you're looking at some of the classic MGs of the past. I certainly am, Peter. I've come down to the car park here at Bourneville College uh, and I found these lovely old vehicles sitting here. Very uh, nostalgic for me, I must say. I had ten Rovers myself in my time. Um, I'm in sort of Rover heaven, which is very appropriate because I'm with a vicar. Oh, well, Colin. Colin. <laughs> Good to see you, Colin. Good Cork. intro. And you were chaplain uh, MG at Rover. MG Rover. I was indeed. I came to Longbridge in 2001. Um, some would say it was a dream job. It was only half a day a week to be trapped into MG Rover Group, but the parish was good as well. So, uh, yeah, but what it, came first, cars oh, or the job? Oh, undoubtedly cars. You've I always know, lifelong cars. car nut and Longbridge related, hence one of the last Rovers and one of the first MGs from you've Longbridge. You've got a load of them, have you? Uh, yeah, two Allegros as well, at least. And, I've uh, heard you've had about 40 Allegros. Yeah, well, when they were cheap and cheerful bangers, who could resist? What, somebody once left sure one on my drive. Hmm? Someone once left one on my drive free. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so, which is your favourite of all the cars? I've got to say it's the 75. It's 70. absolutely brilliant. It's so comfortable. I love these, but they're nostalgia and they're great cars. But the, the 75, just a brilliantly built and car. And just very briefly, very briefly, sad memories. Absolutely. Ten years ago, there was tremendous uncertainty. I mean, the company collapsed. It didn't do a strategic shutdown. And people weren't sure whether they were redundant or not for at least a week. And that was one of the horrendous things to remember, although also the resilience of the community. Colin Cole, thanks very much indeed.
Now, uh, I said we we're going to talk about the way they, the motor industry is today. I mean, experts are predicting that the uh, UK could be producing two million cars a year by 2017, and that will be a record for the country. Uh, if we're going to do that, the West Midlands has got to play a big part in the manufacturing, of course. Well, Giles Latcham has been looking to find out more about this, the renaissance in manufacturing, and he started with a quiz. Got a little visual aid for you. Were more cars made in the UK in 2009 or in 2014? 2009. Uh, what would you say? 2009. Were more cars made in the UK in 2009 or last year? 2009. What do you think? I'm not so sure, but I think it should be 2009. Might surprise you to know half a million more cars were made last year Was than in really? 2009. Oh, you have surprised me. Talking about the car industry round here, it's hardly surprising that some people think it's dying on its feet. This is Northfield, the original Rover heartland, but that's far from the real story. Motor industry in the Midlands and across the UK is really going through something of a renaissance, a real resurgence, driven by a lot of investment, uh, job creation that's taking place, and a very strong domestic car market, which is helping stimulate the demand and stimulating production. So it's really a very positive news story at the moment. A little whistle-stop tour for you. There are currently eight sites in the West Midlands manufacturing cars. Aston Martin in Gaydon. BMW's engines are made at Hams Hall. Dennis Eagle in Warwick make refuse collection vehicles. There are two Jaguar Land Rover sites with another on the way. They made 400,000 cars last year. And the last three are the taxi makers LTC in Coventry, MG Motors still on the Longbridge site, and finally in Malvern, the family-run business of Morgan. And it's not just the workers at those eight sites who are enjoying success. For every 8,000 employees on the vehicle production lines, there are 40,000 others in businesses like this, from component suppliers to dealers. This family-run firm in Walsall supplies parts to both Jaguar and Land Rover. The analysts say in a couple of years' time we could be producing more cars than we were in 1972. How realistic is that? I, I think it is realistic and it's nice to hear, isn't it? that uh, the growth and the success of people like Jaguar Land Rover with their new models is obviously uh, enticing the customer base to buy them and, and that's being good for all of us in the supply base. There's a certain nostalgia for those distant days of mass production by British firms, a vibrancy, a dynamism even. But today's manufacturers, whoever owns them, enjoy huge investment and a slice of a global market. And that underpins their future. Giles Latcham, BBC Midlands Today. And you can see more about the collapse of MG Rover on our Facebook page. Also, there's a special documentary tonight on BBC WM between 7 and 8 o'clock. Right, let's catch up with the weather. It's been beautiful and sunny all day. It's lovely here, even now as we approach 7 o'clock. Can it continue? Here's Shafali. Yes, back to you, Nick. Wow, thanks, Shafali. And that was the Midlands today. Ten years to the day since MG Rover went out of business. As we've heard, the motor manufacturing business is now bouncing back with a vengeance despite the initial pain and turmoil. And the site here is different but thriving. Do have a good evening. From Longbridge, a very good night to you. This is BBC One.